So now, moving on to the next keynote for today, Dr. Anna Luce Nielsen, founder of director of the urban design firm Defector, architect and urbanist from the Netherlands. The firm specialized in urban research and design in the domain of water and floods risk management, working with complex long-scale urban design in such uh, the Dutch Delta program and Bangladesh Delta plan. Dr. Anna also found the Climate Adaptation Lab and Delta Intervention Integral. For her PhD research, focus on the relation between urban designs and flood risk strategies, and also graduated with honors as an architect and urban design from TU Delft, and undertook postgraduate study in landscape architecture and urbanism at the Berglarge Institute in the Rotterdam. She also publishes her books such as Ambitious Housing in the Netherlands, Delta Interventions, Design and Energy, engineering in urban water landscape. And today, her topic for this sem seminar is Water Inclusive Cities. Please welcome. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me here. I'm very honored to be here. Um, today, I will look at the angle of uh, landscape architecture, and in the Netherlands, uh, urban design is kind of part of landscape architecture, um, from a regional perspective. So to also show how landscape architecture can um, be used in future projects. Um, and I do a lot of long-term projects with regard to um, climate change challenges. This is the Netherlands, and the blue part here, I'll see if I have a point, the blue part is below sea level. And actually, here is already a part of Germany in it. The Netherlands is quite small, and you see that most of our cities um, are positioned in an area which is below sea level. Um, we face a lot of challenges, and I think you will recognize uh, many of them, because they're quite generic for uh, Delta cities. Um, and today, I'll focus on the flood risk protection um, in combination with urbanization. Uh, but of course, in this delta, we also have the port economy, uh, which is a very important one, the social inclusion. We just heard about uh, cultural heritage, spatial quality, food production, energy, ecology, um, land subsidence, fresh water, and mobility. So there are a lot of uh, issues that the national government is trying to address. And landscape architecture uh, architects are involved in uh, helping to come up with a sustainable future. Um, well, this is the Netherlands. Here I overlapped the flood occurrence um, with the density in the world. Uh, and we do see, we call that the settlement paradox of urban deltas, that those delta areas are both having fertile grounds, very good port connections, uh, but unfortunately are very vulnerable to sea, um, sea level rise climate change and uh, increased river discharges. This is the area where I come from, the Netherlands. We see the city of Rotterdam here. We have a big port area and you see that we have all these dike rings, they are polders. Um, so those used to be wetlands, they have been ringed with a levee. After that, um, the soil started oxidizing and started uh, going down. Uh, which is unfortunately and wasn't foreseen when they made the polders. Um, and now some areas are at minus seven, minus five um, below sea level. Um, so protection becomes very vital. Here we see our original delta, or at least the projection of how they think it looked around 1320. Um, with on the background, the current harbor, and uh, we see that the rivers have been canalized, um, and it's really an engineered condition. Something that the Netherlands are, on the one hand, very proud of, um, but also ask for reflection with extra knowledge we have now. Um, this was 1953. We had a big flood in the Netherlands, and after that, um, because of course after a flood, your first priority is making sure your uh, country is protected and safe from floods. They made a very big 
barrier program. We see them here. Um, and they put up a lot of barriers along the sea to make sure the storms from the sea uh, wouldn't again flood those estuaries. Um, they did that in 53, and they took into consideration a lot of additional aspects next to flood risk, uh, but flood risk and cost were the most dominant. Uh, fresh water, agriculture, uh, the port economy, urban growth, and this was the time in the Netherlands where the need for recreation came. So people were very worried about the um, fast growth of the city, the livability of the city. Uh, the cities were getting polluted and they wanted more recreational space. There's no mentioning of ecology here because it, wasn't, it simply wasn't discovered yet. Uh, it didn't exist. They were talking about maybe um, the barriers having an impact on the amount of fish they could uh, harvest here. Um, but the landscape was still very functional. It was agriculture providing uh, food, fish providing food. Um, and by making those barriers, those uh, salty waters would become fresh water, uh, which had a lot of benefit for agriculture. Um, a lot of people ask me, why are the Dutch still dealing with flood risk? Haven't that been care taken care of with this 53 plan? Um, well, because of climate change, I never put climate change on my slides because when I'm in the US, there's no climate change. There's just magic sea level rise. Uh, but with increased water levels, uh, this is kind of the Dutch system. We have the rivers, we have the unembanked areas, the floodplains. Uh, very often they're occupied. We have the levees and behind it the polder. And uh, risk is often defined as the probability of a flood times the consequence of a flood. In the Netherlands, we focus a lot on this probability reduction by building levees. Um, but because the economic value and the amount of inhabitants behind the levee grows, uh, we need to keep updating those levees. So it's kind of what they call a lock-in. We, we keep busy with it. Very unfortunately, the levees also sink into the ground because of this uh, peat soil. Um, and the latest predictions for the sea level rise in the Netherlands are two to three meters in 2100. So that is uh, quite severe. So there's a new Delta program, and what is very interesting about it is that it's proactive. Um, we're quite safe now. We don't have a lot of issues, um, but they want to make a vision for 2100 and investigate, will it still be a safe place? And we see with this Delta program, the same ecology is much more important. Uh, cultural heritage, subsidence, land subsidence, uh, and energy transition. So there are kind of new topics that weren't in the debate 50 years ago. Um, when you're a landscape designer, um, you're very used to working on different skills, and that is a very valuable contribution of the designers to those kind of projects, um, because the engineers design functional solutions. And designers can really skip through skills and see what skills are best to address something. Um, here we see the, the largest skill on which you can take a flood risk intervention. This is our barrier system, uh, one from the Delta plants. This one can open because the harbor is behind it. Um, and it closes if the water gets five centimeter higher than this in the city center. You can also choose to address this at a local level. Um, this is not a proposal to remove the barrier, but what they found out with sea level rise, uh, now the barrier closes once every 10 years. Um, but they made a calculation that if the sea level rises, it would have to close 27 times a year. It has a failure probability of one failure every 30 times you try to close it. Um, yeah, so that would mean that uh, once a year it wouldn't close which is a big safety risk, but also if we close off our port 30 times a year, it will lose the ranking on the, um, on the eco economy list. Um, so this would be a solution on a local scale. So here we designed the park ring around the area to protect it. And you can even do it on a more local scale. Um, this is in Dordrecht, and here they floodproofed the houses. Uh, it's, it's quite expensive, but you see this guy um, yeah, enjoying his house during floodwaters. You can really close it. 
Um, I'll try to explain some of the theories behind this uh, as well, because we're at a university. Um, and in the Netherlands, they're exploring different cornerstones. And that means that they look at different options for the flood risk protection system, and then ask urban and landscape designers to reflect on its potentials. Um, this is a proposal made together with the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, of course, their dream is to have a completely open estuary um, with a lot of ecological benefits. So you see, everyone has their own dream of this area. And uh, in this project, they're mapped all of them. So here we see that all the barriers have been removed. Um, this is student work from our TU Delft Delta Intervention Studio, uh, where students try to draw those areas where you could get more water. This is the current polar levee, and a lot of projects focus on moving back that levee, uh, and then have a bigger intertidal zone that can also be used for recreation uh, and living. And we do that through the skills. Uh, so on the local scale, uh, the students also designed houses with them. And those houses have um, a space close to the water. Uh, or high water levels are in winter. And then in the Netherlands, you don't want to sit outside. So this space is available in summer. In winter, it's not available um, because the water levels will be higher, but also you don't need it in that period. Um, so that is how we follow up with design. What we see a lot with involving uh, people from the community in those kind of plans is that we make designs for 50 years later. So now we're designing kind of for, well, we always said 2050, but it's already 2018, so we have to move up 2070. Uh, and people don't realize how different the world will be then, uh, especially uh, when you talk with the community and you talk about in 50 years maybe changing something in their neighborhood, and there's this 80-year-old guy who is opposing it, and you think, well, at that moment you're going to be 130. Uh, you're probably not going to be there. Um, so we always show them how, what it looked like before. So this is what Rotterdam looked like in the time they made the Delta Plan. And this is what it looks like kind of 50, 60 years later. So we see an enormous growth in the area. And we always try to use this for people to show them that you cannot make blueprints for the future um, because more will change than you can anticipate on. Um, so to be able with, to deal with this, uh, one of the important aspects of this kind of long-term strategies are scenarios. And scenarios are not um, options you would prefer, but um, those are scenarios that you cannot influence. And in the Netherlands, the scenarios are based on socio-economic development, which can either be uh, decreasing or increasing, and climate change, which can either decrease and increase. And those are some images made to show people how different the future could be. Um, so this is used to influence the political debate. Here we see very high economic growth with very little uh, climate change. So the city can kind of extend as it wants. Very high economic growth with severe climate change. Uh, the city can still develop, but you'll need to store much more water. Um, low socioeconomic development, low climate change, everything will stay as it is. This is kind of a Bangkok uh, <laughs> scenario. And actually, with severe climate change and low social economic development, you have an issue. You will not be able to, to afford this very expensive flood risk system, and you'll have to make big choices about which areas to protect and not. So those yeah, are used in the political debate. Um, and it's very important to design with uncertainty with this. Uh, this is Hamburg, half a city. It's uh, actually across the border, but I'm cheating a bit and taking the best practices from Germany as well. And this is an area where they choose to let the water in. So this is a floodplain. It floods quite frequently. Actually, it became a spectacle uh, when people know it's high water. Everyone wants to go there to uh, experience it. So this public space can flood, and then this area is the dry backbone. And what you see is that the buildings there, which are in the floodplain, have this double root system so that you can also use it uh, in case of a flood. 
Um, so that is very interesting. Those have flood-proof doors, so you can close them. Uh, here it only goes to a certain level. Um, but it's a very interesting uh, project. And what they did here is they used a model that very accurately predicts how high the water will be. Unfortunately, this is just finished. They didn't take into account enough climate change. The climate change is more severe than they thought. And this has just been realized and they already have to upgrade it um, and make sure those barriers are higher. This is a very nice design, but it's not very flexible. It's not very easy uh, to add another meter or two meters. So that is very important in designing in relation to climate change so far. Uh, every 10 years it turns out to be worse than expected. So your designs need to be able to adapt to that. Um, those are some of the design research that are being done by designers um, where they show the current situation. Uh, in the Netherlands a lot is being done in making the uh, river sites public. So in general the river site is a public uh, space and it's seen as a big disadvantage if it's not. So I would try to keep as much as the public um, riverfront open. And here you see they're kind of looking at different water levels we could uh, get in the future and trying to see could we still adjust or not. So here you see a design for the most extreme water level where you see we will get disconnected a bit more from the river, but we'll get this riverside park. Um, a very important aspect of this is the multidisciplinarity. Um, actually, as designers, we're kind of the guests uh, invited at the table uh, with the engineers that are not used to thinking designs or community involvement at all. Uh, so it always takes a lot of time to really sit around the table, tell them what is important, um, and find common grounds. But also for the engineers to explain us, um, how does flood risk work? How does ecology work? So that we know what the guiding principles are and we can involve it in our design. So every project you learn a lot um, based on the experts you have on the table. Economy, financing is also very essential for how you make your design. So we always do that in integrated design teams. Um, a very important aspect of designers in the Dutch debate around climate change is also uh, showing how essential it is. So those are the maps that the government communicated about how terrible our future will be if we don't act. But no one got a sense of urgency from those drawings. So um, because it's showing where the levees need to be elevated. So we changed it and in red we showed all the levees that need to be elevated and the thickness of the line represents how much. Um, very basic visualization, just red for bad and green for good and thicker for worse. Uh, but then immediately you see the story arising of those polders, especially on the uh, edge between the sea and the river, uh, facing a major challenge in levee elevations and in safety. Um, so this map making is a very important aspect of our job and making a good map is really difficult. Um, we also notice it with people that start working in our office, 3Ds, uh, go very quickly, collages, but a good map that tells the right story is a real big challenge. Um, I'll show some example projects. Uh, this is our seaside, Scheveningen. Uh, we see the historic Kurhaus, um, historic kind of um, recreational building, the seafront and a lot of apartments. And the levee is actually here. And the government was asking us to study whether we could reinforce this levee with 12 meters or whether that would give a spatial issue. Well, um, I give you some seconds to imagine how you would elevate this with 12 meters. It's quite difficult. Um, so again, we sat down with a lot of local people to ask them what they thought were qualities with a lot of engineers that could explain us what was necessary. And we came up with different possibilities for the extension. So here we see that Kurhaus we just saw. Here is the original levee. And we basically said there's no way we can elevate that with 12 meters without destroying uh, individual property. 
Uh, but there is the opportunity to go seaward, there is space. And then there are two basic options, one of making a hard K, uh, and more of a business district, and one of continuing the landscape uh, and really creating this city behind the dunes. Um, those designs are not made to be realized on a short term, but to inform the city on the decision they had to make about a hard extension or a soft extension, and really show them what kind of different benefits that would give. Um, and those images of completely different uh, seaside towns, they could take to do the community engagement and make a good choice about the type of intervention. And um, what we did a lot in this, um, what is very nice is you also get inspired by the technical principles. So here we see the principle of a perpendicular dam. And if you make one, actually automatically you'll get sedimentation over a certain stretch and further on you'll get erosion. So that is what we discuss together with the engineers. They make us understand the principles and then we start doing the spatial design exercises with it. Like, okay, if we have that, where could we position it? This was very nice from an urban perspective because this area was going to be renewed, um, but it would give erosion at this cultural heritage site and you would need a lot of extra protection. Um, this was optimal from the flood risk perspective because this would be protected as well as this. Um, but here an ecological area starts and we were scared that this would bring too much development uh, into that ecological area and it would put it under pressure. Um, so in the end it was positioned here in the middle to extend the old village. But it's really nice how in that way uh, the technical knowledge and the design uh, come to solutions where everything is already integrated. And when I started with this topic about 15 years ago, it would still be that designers would draw a river bypass, uh, then pass it on to the engineers. The engineers would say, well, you make this river go uphill, it doesn't work that way. The designers would be frustrated because the engineer was telling them all the time that what they were thinking of wasn't possible and the engineers were um, irritated by designers being stupid and not understanding that water doesn't flow uphill. So we came quite far from that moment. So this was the other option that came from the technical principle. Um, also on a smaller scale, I show a part in Sliedrecht. Uh, this is that dike ribbon uh, with a lot of kind of 100, 150 year old houses. Uh, the river, which is a big shipping uh, route, and here the ecological area on the other side. Um, and this project was quite tricky because there's not a lot of space. In the Netherlands we have a bit of the same issue as here. Um, every space needs to be used carefully, planned carefully, because otherwise we don't have sufficient. Um, this is how a levee looks like in this area. Uh, we see the old houses and we see that this levee, that is a story I told, it constantly needs to be upgraded. Um, but at a certain moment this gives kind of a spatial issue. So the government asked us, could you make an inquiry, inquiry how we can elevate this levee two meters further? Um, also that is quite a challenge uh, on, the, on the local scale. And this is also where you can shift skills. So you can also advise them uh, if it's really not possible on this scale uh, to move to the bigger scale and solve it there. Also here we did a lot of um, exercises. This is what it looks like now. It looks a bit like the before photos we just saw in the previous presentations and this is how they made it. Actually I'm not a big fan of this. Um, what they did previously is just creating more space by demolishing all the buildings. Um, creating a new bump and building new houses on it. It's not that it's bad quality housing, but it's completely different than that old atmosphere. And we also see that those skills don't really match anymore. Um, another option they sometimes apply is uh, making a new levee in the back garden along the river. Um, but if you need to elevate this two meters further, uh, of course it's not nice for the houses there. Um, and also with this new levy, everything gets tight because we have regulations for the width of a shipping route. Um, there are prime ecological areas in the Netherlands that are very heavily protected. You cannot touch them because otherwise everyone has their own witch to 
make them smaller every time. Um, so you cannot really shift this. So again, we sat with the full group of people. I have a lot of photos of this, but that is because it's really essential. And we noted down all the technical options you could make. And what we saw is that the engineers before, they already deleted some options because they said it was spatially not possible. Then I said, okay, maybe you should leave that part to the designers um, because we're trained in that. And let's test of those kind of options, for instance, making a cover dam uh, near the river, whether that would be possible. And in the end, we made a design. It's a bit on the hard side, um, but that really created an extra walkway along the river and could make that already privatized riverfront uh, public again, which was something that a lot of people living in the area uh, appreciated a lot. Oh. Uh, a similar thing we did in Brazil, um, where this was the levee, and those levees have the tendency to kind of, because they're elevated, to block off the city and the park from the water. So what we proposed here is to make this walkway in the river, which would be the new levee, uh, but would also give kind of a new access for people towards the waterfront and connect it to the city areas so that they could also cross the road and activate the river area. Um, this is a way of mapping we use. Um, so I said before, this river has all kinds of different functions from ecological to shipping to social, uh, commercial, housing. Um, and what we do here is we map all those different functions to see where there could be conflict or where there could be synergy um, so that we know we always have the full picture. Um, this is one of the projects where the existing dike was here and they simply trained the river too narrow so we found out that is not uh, possible anymore and a new backside river was created uh, to make sure more water can flow here because this was all um, urbanized so it was difficult to change this but we could go back here and create that extra channel. Uh, this is called Room for the River. It became a very famous principle of instead of yeah, occupying, training the river, giving it more space. And it's better to not build everything full because later on it will be very expensive to clear it again. So better make spatial reservations. Uh, this is dual land use. So here in the dunes there is a parking garage. And this is building with nature. And this is a principle where they try to have more natural processes in flood risk management. So what they would normally do is supply a lot of sand to the coast to make sure it grows together with the sea level. Um, but that caused a lot of ecological inconvenience because every 10 years you would put on a little bit. And here they put a lot of sand on one place and then the natural current can deposit it over the coastline. Um, this created a very nice recreational area as well. So now, as it's designed to do, it's slowly disappearing and people are protesting against it disappearing. First they were protesting against it <laughs> being established and now they're protesting uh, against the disappearance. And I think what is very important of all those um, processes and methodologies is that you shouldn't copy solutions. And I see that too often. Um, also with Dutch engineering companies, they go abroad and they start building dike rings and levees, though we know they have disadvantages. Um, so it's really important to use the same methodology, but in a different context. To give a small example, um, this is the Rotterdam adaptation plan, and it's showing this major issue we have with water logging, with this old man not being able to reach the other side of the street. Um, very good interventions came out of that, but then we were asked to do that in Bangladesh. That's a little bit different. Um, so you really have to take into consideration the differences. What we also see, and you will recognize that here, for instance, when working in Bangladesh, um, is that it's much more difficult to plan urbanization. In the Netherlands, you can just make a plan and the top-down government will make sure it gets implemented. And what we actually see in Bangladesh is that the planners there are making sensible plans and then they say, okay, we put a building restriction zone here. Uh, but there are no means to apply this building restriction. So what we see here 
is that in 10 years, this whole area, which has a building restriction, has been filled up, and it's not by slums, it's really by high-end uh, project development. Um, so you need to find other means to secure the space. Uh, for instance, by assigning it a function, like a park. Um, so you can use a similar approach, uh, but you see that here we also started with the cornerstones, like we did in the Netherlands. Um, actually, when we started in Bangladesh, and uh, we were kind of sent as expert with knowledge of the Delta program, uh, we found out that in Bangladesh they were thinking it was the first Delta program with all the barriers and levees. Uh, though we were actually from the second Delta program of all the room for the river and soft measures. Um, but one of the wishes was like this dike ring area, uh, kind of the Dutch system applied. And we also made an alternative where it's much more a living with water perspective. Uh, with small dike rings around the urban cores and a lot of opportunity for the water to get in, in between. Um, because also you have different uh, governance, financing and maintenance. Um, in the Netherlands, 50%, almost 50% of the budget for flood risk is maintenance. So taking care of the structure that is already there. Um, in Bangladesh, they take the money for constructing levies from, for instance, the World Bank. Um, but it's not possible to apply for maintenance budgets in those structures. Um, so that means that if you construct a levy, it could in the end get less safe. Um, because if it's not maintained and you have a perceived safety, uh, people behind the levy don't take in consideration there could be a flood, and then if it's there, the consequence can be bigger. Um, so those are all things you should take into consideration. So in the end, that led to a completely different approach um, where we, on the one hand, uh, deepened part of the area so that it could um, accommodate more water and build this very high building ground so there wouldn't be a levee that needs to be maintained, but everything would simply be elevated quite far. Um, and the lands around it, uh, we would keep a lot of floodplains that had a ecological and agricultural use. So a completely different system than you would apply uh, in the Netherlands, but better fits, we hope, the local situation. Uh, one thing that is very important is to preserve identity. Um, when we were working in Bangladesh, and of course we did that with a lot of local experts, so um, yeah, it's not that we're designing their country, um, but we were thinking about river training because there was kind of a plan from the engineers there um, to train the river on two sides uh, so that you would get more land on the sides um, but that actually would kind of destroy that image of Bangladesh if you look at it from Google Earth you have this intertwining river characteristics with a lot of chars um, so what we said is maybe construct your cities on the chars that are already there um, then train it in little pieces around it, but don't train the full river. Um, and really make sure you keep that identity of the intertwining rivers and use it for establishing cities. And again, those are not uh, proposals that they're going to make next year. So they're really images to inform um, the government and later the detailed plan will be made. That was it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. And for your very interesting um, projects that you shared with us. And yes, I believe that a lot of us has to be like dealing with this kind of problem in the future, especially with the flood management. Thank you. So now for the third speaker for today, may I invite uh, Mr. Yosapon Bunsom. He is a um, the director from Shama Company Limited Thailand and graduate from Jula University with a second honors. And he doing the Master of Art in Urban Management and Architecture Urban Universe in the University of Wales. And right now he also a visitor critics at Jula University as well as Kasetsat University.
And he also being a speaker at the IFLR, APR, or Thai International Feder Federation of Landscape Architects, Asia Pacific Regions. And for today, his seminar, he will conduct the top in the topic of re repositioning of landscape architect. Welcome. So good morning, everyone, and I'm very excited to be here because it's uh, in the morning of Saturday, and everyone can come, and we're going to have a lot of discussion about this um, interesting topic. So the topic that I would like to discuss and share with you is about the future. The first question is, how does the future look like to you? What does the future look like to you, Ram? Yeah, how it's like. All flat, yeah. Based on your presentation just now, all flooded. What else? Michael? More unused building. So it's like all the abandoned buildings. More green, yeah, small. Sorry? Moss, yeah, <laughs> moss, yeah. This is a future that looks like to um, my company. So this is a fancy party um, during the uh, new year. And my staff said, oh, we can have the, the project on Mars, and then we might have the hybrid uh, people who work in our office. And my partner here is getting older. And myself is wearing some of the um, mask because uh, of the, the oxygen is not uh, enough in the, in the earth. And this is the future in, in my imagination 30 years ago when I was a kid. So the future that to, to me is, is about high-rise building, a lot of uh, people smiling and skyscraper and, and, and sky train which totally different, all similar, quite similar is what happened today. But the thing is, not much of the people smiling in this city right now. This is my hometown, which is Bangkok. So the Bangkok uh, city is um, full of um, problems and pollutions and, 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 and places that are interesting, but you really need to, to fight it. Imagine that you've grown up in this kind of city when you was a kid and, and then you need to go into the school and then go through the traffic jam every day and it keeps me wondering whether can we have a better life. It's not all the only um, physical problems that we are facing. We are also facing the social issue as well like uh, unfairness, exploitation, inequality, ignorance and corruption. So if you're talking about the future or if you're talking about uh, the city, is always uh, the problems of the physical um, space and is always the problems of the social at the same time. So it keeps me wondering whether is there any better alternative way in creating the, the city where the people and the nature can live in inclusively. And the thing is the passion in all of us that we want to create a better future whether it will be similar to what we draw when we used to be the kids or in our imagination. But we always have a passion to, to get a better future. And I think the landscape architect or the profession that related to environmental uh, design is about creating um, the better uh, space, creating the, the, the tree tree that can be transformed to, to be better. And actually, I just came back from Beijing. We have been discussing about, um, uh, together with uh, all the landscape around the designer in Asia, and we're talking about what we are doing now. Is, is it really matter to, to the earth? And most of the work that we are doing nowadays is just the top of the iceberg. I mean, 80% of the work that we have been doing is about uh, beautifying the, the place. It's not about transforming the, the place. And this is what happened to our industry nowadays. And, and um, I think the, the way we're doing it is become like a marketing tools in um, creating uh, more and more um, beautiful city. But it's really matter to 
the, the society? This is the question that we need to, to ask um, ourselves as a profession. And believe it or not, the more we do, the more we design the city, the more we create the exclusion city. Because uh, we only serve the certain group of the people and then we clearly make the, the whole city be the better place that we would like to, to live. And we are part of the, the problem as well. This is a Bangkok map on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side this is what happened today. And you can notice that there are a lot of canals and all shut around the city because the people in the past are aware that um, Bangkok city is in the, the, the floodplain area of Jopria River. So they decide uh, the, the all shut and the canal as a mitigation uh, tools in pro protecting the city from flooding. But uh, we ex keep expanding the city and we close up all the, the canal system and uh, replace all the agricultural land to become the, the urban area. So we slowly change from the, the resilient attitude to become more very rigid and exclusion attitude in creating our environment nowadays. And this is what happened, similar to what Anne just showed in Bangladesh, that uh, people no longer be able to live with water anymore. So the water becomes the threat. It's no longer the friends or it's no longer the, the resources that we use to be part of uh, our day of living. And we hardly walk. If you go to, down to the street, you can hardly find a place where you can walk easily because the city was designed for the car, not for the people. And the more we expand the city, the, the greener green area will be reduced. So we have only like a six square meter per person comparing to Singapore of 66 square meter per person, which is about 10 times less. The picture on the left hand side is not in Bangkok, it's in India. It's everywhere when you can find a gigantic um, rain tree. And on the right hand side, just in front of my office, they're expanding the, the roads and you need to give away the, the tree for uh, the expansion of the city. It's not about the quantity alone, it's about the quality as well. So we don't have much of the qual good quality public space. I think just now um, uh, Murari mentioned about the quality of the, the, the park. And this is a message that uh, the government is sending to us. What's the message that they're sending to us when we when encounter this kind of the bench? Do not sit that long. What else? Don't sleep. Don't talk to each other. And quickly go and better taking care of the park uh, nicely. And what else? You can't play anything that you imagine that you want to use in the park. And funny it is about this. We don't facing the climate change yet. We don't have the snow, but they're forbidding us for ice skating in the park in the hot climate. So they be, be, be very concerned how you're going to use the park. The smiling. No, oh no smiling. Yeah, yeah. This is one thing that we can do in Thailand, right? And of course, most of the budget that we use to landscaping the, the government, we actually we have quite a lot of budget in doing the landscape in the, in, around the country. But uh, the government and most of the public um, understand that the landscape is about doing three things. Beautiful lampo. What else? Toilet. And the pavement. This is about the landscape um, architecture and it's about the landscape architect job to do this from the government point of view and certain public point of view. And of course we have quite a lot of uh, unutilized area underneath the expressway because the city was designed for the car. And of course one of the threats that we are facing right now is about the, the development of the river because the Japia River is in the heart of the city. And because we are afraid of the flood and we have to uh, construct the flood wall in order to protect the city from flooding. And this is what happened. It's going to destroy all those uh, river community and it's going to make the, the, uh, the river um, shrinking and, and narrower because you're going to fill up this um, gap of the land with the soil and, and then you no longer have the connection and connectivity with the river anymore. 
and the and the garbage in the in in the river is 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 a shield problem and is flow into the, the sea. And Bangkok is sinking, and because of, uh, the sea is rising, and uh, the city is subsided. So probably the I'm not sure the wall is it the, the sustainable solution to protect the city from flooding in this um, climate change. And we are facing this um, smoke and pollu air pollution right now. It's become very, uh, um, we don't have the comprehensive solution at the moment. And not surprised that we're not the best city to live, but it's the best city to visit. So we rank is about uh, 129 for the best city to, to live. And I think we don't want to live in the city that is going to be uh, for the tourists, but uh, we want to create a city for everyone, for the residents and also for the visitor at the same time. And I think one of the um, main aspects is that uh, we don't have much of the interaction and participation with the creation of the city. It's always left out to the, the job for the government or the, to the specialists. And what happened now is that uh, there are a lot of uh, rising issues. Of course, there's growing population and urban expansion. Climate change is coming. And emerging of the new social behavior, the changing of the population and, and, uh, the, the, uh, and also the, the way we interact in, in terms of the, the social interaction. And the rising of the local wisdom, power. I went to one of the, the village uh, next to the Mekong River and they're constructing this uh, amazing uh, bamboo bridge to connect to this um, island. And they construct the temporary structure in the island during the, the summer season. So we need to recognize the, the local wisdom and how we're going to utilize and uh, create the value out of that. And also it's the rising of the people power. And nowadays, we, we don't wait for the government alone to create a better solution. As um, Anne just mentioned, that we need an alternative and um, solution for create a better city. But nowadays, people do it um, by their own in, in various issues from garbage issue, um, transportation, environmental, and the river. And the value is changed. This is a small shop in Little Tao in the north of um, Thailand. And what it, they try to do is that they didn't care much about how, big, how much money they earn. It's about creating the better iced yogurt for the customer. And they would like to, to serve it for the better health of, for the people. So it's a lot of uh, challenges that we are facing in the future and the current issue that we uh, need to deal with or what we're going to do. So first of all, I think we can't really thinking of the new tool without having the new goal. The new goal is about creating the inclusive um, society where the people and the nature can live in harmony. And I think you need to take care of the current uh, situation uh, at, that we are facing at the same time. And of course, we need to have the new instrument, we need to have the new tools in order to, um, uh, we need to, in order to, to arrive in, uh, in the future. So the new tools that we like to propose is there, there, here they are. First of all, the city is not about the collection of the architecture or the physical space, it's about the ecosystem. The ecosystem of the people and the ecosystem of the, 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 the nature. And our job is how we can design the physical forms in order to respond to those ecosystems. And we need to change all the, those exclusivity and exclusion sp uh, space in the city to be uh, combined as one total environment. And we need to look at the way how we can uh, utilize the existing asset that the city has, either the structure, either the people in the communities. And we need to find a way to understand those behavior or ecosystem through this uh, participatory design, through the intervention, through the uh, uh, experimental or reach out activities. And of course, we need to innovate new things. Like this guy on the left, they combined uh, the boat with the motorcycle in order to navigate the city during the flood. And this is my imagination of the dress in the future where you need to wear this um, oxygen mask where you get oxygen from the fish tank, portable fish tank. 
So how are we going to come up with this uh, new idea? This is uh, the challenge that we are facing. And of course, we need to empower people because we don't know best. People sometimes know best than the specialist. And about the education, we need to think whether we can change the way to educate to be more collaborate between the practice, practitioner and the uh, professor and, and focusing more on the, the real topic to given to, to be the, the task for the, the students. And of course, the, pl the platform that we really need it because we need everyone to, to, to share the idea and start from the beginning in a, the same platform, not from the top-down process, but collaboration process. And the role of the designer has to be changed from the, the, the one who decided to, to be the one who facilitated uh, the, the, faci the, facilitate the need of, of the, the, the people. So if you think about that, there are various tools as a landscape architect or as a designer to use from policy level, process level, and reach out com to the people level, and also in order to come out with a very sensitive product. So what we really need is about the platform at the same time to combine those, those resources. I think what Think City is that is about providing the platform for various uh, stakeholders. So the, the landscape architect, um, architecture is, is not about the, the physical space to, 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 to me. It's about the, the change agents and the change agents in sending the message to the people, criticizing the situation that we are facing, inspiring and transforming the society. And of course, I think this is very important aspect. It's about creating the conversation with the people in a positive way. So I will show you uh, the projects that we've been working with for the past 10 years. The first one is about dealing with uh, the flood. Um, we're facing the flood in 2012, and, and those are probably the, the most um, wake-up call that we, we're aware that the, the climate change is real. And when we went out to, to take a look at the site, we realized that there are two territories um, sitting side by side. So one is about fluid territory, which uh, received uh, the flood, and another territory is about the solid uh, uh, city where you not know in, where you don't interacting with uh, the nature anymore. And it's not about the physical form; it's about the way of, of life of the people as well. So some of the people is afraid of flood; they they need to evacuate from the the, the city very quickly. But uh, some of the people still convey the life as it is because they know how to live with the water, they know how to catch the fish, they know how to row the boat, and do, um, they can swim it. So I think some of the people are very happy to receive the, the, the flood because it's part of uh, the, the, the natural phenomenon and they can get more food out of the, the flood. So I think the problem is that this is the Japaya River floodplain area. It used to be the, 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 the sea. It's a good part of the Gulf of Thailand before. And then because of that uh, settlement from the Japaya River uh, floodplain, we slowly formed the, 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 the land. And then the city mostly situ situated around uh, the, 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 the river. So the more we're expanding the, the, the city, the more uh, waterway will be blocked. So I think this is the two tree trees that are living side by side. But uh, what we would like to propose to, to the government during that time is about utilize the existing agricultural land that is already covered most of the tree tree to, to, be, to combine as a water detention network. Because nowadays, the, 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 farm, the farmer don't allow um, the, the flood water to, to get into their farmland because they want to uh, maintain the to productivity throughout the whole year. It's not like in the past where they can stop in a certain period of time. But uh, if we can mo utilize it well, providing space for the uh, water, and then uh, providing facility allow the depoter, it can encourage the, farm, the farmer and also the urban developer to uh, allow the water to flood their land and utilize it for the green, to produce green energy and become like a water agriculture during the flood season. This is our imagination during our research uh, 10 years ago. And then um, we actually be able to implement part of that um, visual, uh, vision in our actual project in Bangkok. This is Bangkok City. And then um, we are uh, we proposing this uh, strategy in using the, the park to uh, become the water detention in the uh, part of the, uh, at the peripheral of the, the Bangkok City. 
It used to be the, the farmland before, so like part of the orchard uh, structure. And then uh, what our proposal is done is that to excavate the, the land and fill up to, and, and form the, the mound and to use it for the recreation and, and become the place for the, the nature. So it's under construction right now, and you can see that uh, the mouth has already formed, and then the, the, the earth has already excavated and to re receive more uh, water capacity, and it's providing with a lot of uh, um, 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 activities like uh, exhibition spaces and education spaces and, and then uh, uh, walkway and public uh, functions. So it's going to be finished and, um, by the end of this year, and then we can see what happened, uh, how they're going to interact with the people around uh, those um, parks. About the walkway, I think we would like to reclaim that area back to the people. And this is what happened. We organized uh, the workshop with the students, and then we carry out this installation, where uh, is there the, a possibility we can use uh, the, reef, um, the, the, the footpath as a place for recreation to sit and hang out and have a lot of uh, activities. And we implement those ideas to our actual project in the center of Bangkok in Saturn Road. It used to be like a very uh, dense and a lot of traffic jam, less of uh, greenery. And our idea is that we should um, feel um, revitalize not only the, the, to, to make the street to be more alive with uh, more greenery and then uh, clean up the, 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 the water quality at, this, at, at the canal in the center of the road to be uh, more cleaner and allow the people to use it as a place for recreation. And this is what happened that uh, we would like to see in the future. This is uh, the government project that we have uh, been working with, with uh, a lot of uh, um, specialist engineer and, and uh, co gone, tr gone through a lot of uh, consultation with the uh, stakeholders. I think what we try to do is we try to imagine that the street is not just a place for the people, but it is also the place for the, uh, for the nature at the same time. And we're also looking at the, the possibilities, how we can uh, use uh, the building as a catalyst uh, element in generating uh, uh, nature in the city. The picture on the left-hand side is a very beautiful um, building. You have a lot of clippers. But on the right-hand side, it's quite similar in color. But the differentiation is that it's not the real plants. It's the artificial turf. That we, nowadays, people think that putting the artificial turf is, is quite all right. This can solve the, the green issue and it can answer to the climate change. This is the norms that are spread out into the, the urban devel developer nowadays. And the question that we've been asking to the government policy is that the more we, because we can't really find the, the actual green space on ground, why don't the government encouraging the, 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 the developer to put a uh, vertical green in, in, the, in, in their buildings because it can help to uh, mitigate the, um, the, the urban heat island and providing more uh, greenery to the city. So we proposed to sing this to, to the, one of the, our clients. The client asked us to do the landscape around the building, but it's, as you can see, that there's no, not much of the, the area around the building. So what we propose is that we create this um, living um, green facade to wrap around the, the building that they already decided uh, at, at first that uh, there doesn't uh, really think that this can be possible. But we think that this is possible because you're not only providing the, the, the outstanding um, uh, language to the city, but uh, you can providing the, the, the greenery and to, to, to the area around it at the same time. And about the landscape architecture is not always about uh, the garden, but uh, we also interpret in the architecture way as well. So this is uh, our vision for the house that we did uh, two years ago during the uh, exhibition um, uh, in, in Bangkok. And we imagine that uh, the house can, can become the green provider to the city and become the place for the people, for the community as well. So you can provide a herbs garden and community garden in front at your facade of your, your house. But then you go inside to become your own uh, private space where you can enjoy your own garden. 
So if we can build this typology of the house around the city, you're not only providing uh, more space for the people to live, but it's also providing the, the greenery for the city at the same time. Another topic that we're raising to the society is about whether do we have too much mall and can we combine the mall with mall, park or public space? This question we raised during the, the, the public agenda that Bangkokian debating whether how are we going to utilize this abandoned or empty land in the city center, whether it should be the, another shopping mall or it should be another public park. It's, been, it's become the, the public debate for many years and we are part of the uh, social group in order to provide the other, other alternative. This is what the government plan to do as um, you can see that is uh, focusing on the economic value. But uh, we are part of the group in providing some alternative for the debate. I think what we try to do is that uh, inst this is the, the area. It used to be at the peripheral of Bangkok before and then at the, at the moment it's become in the center. It's high in the economic value and how you're going to combine those uh, economic value, heritage value and then the, the natural value to, to provide a better alternative for the city. This is the, the very real challenge for the, the government. I think what we've tried to propose is that we can uh, put all the built up area underneath the, the green surface and then reserve some of the area for the water detention to receive uh, more water during the, the flood season in helping the city mitigating with, uh, with the flood uh, phenomena. And we try to keep most of the um, abandoned uh, factory, which is part of the railway yard in this uh, abandoned land, and then uh, keeping some of the area for the water de detention. And most of the built up area will be built uh, in the low density, but uh, you still have the, the mall, you still have the exhibition space, but underneath the, the, the green roof. And it becomes the ideal place for the people to, to hang around and in this uh, hot climate because it becomes the uh, shared uh, public space in, in the city center. And on top of that, it can become like uh, the green um, space for the urban farming and many functions for the people. And I think this is not uh, the final uh, solution that we think it could be, but uh, it is, uh, we put up this for the debate. It's nobody pay effort to do this job, but uh, this is part of our initiative to uh, come up with the idea for the public to debate whether is there any alternative besides build up uh, another mall in the city center. Can it be combined and can it be providing with the greenery with the peop for the people at the same time? And we're not only working for the public uh, sector, and this is part of 80% uh, job that we've been doing. We're doing for the developers, uh, doing the condominiums and resort and commercial space as well. And our job is how we can combine the elements of the, uh, the nature into the developments. For example, we built a lot of uh, condominiums and how can we combine the, the forest and nature to be part of that built up environment. This is uh, the project that we uh, did and then we quite success in creating a lot of uh, uh, greenery, but it's not about the greenery, it's about the various uh, planting species, native species, to attract the birds and become the natural sanctuary, not only for the people, but also for the uh, nature at the same time. And our job is not only in, in Thailand, and then we also doing this kind of the concept in providing uh, uh, nature into the built up environment. This is a business park in Singapore. And we won the design comp this design competition, I think, uh, five years ago. And in order to connect the nature uh, reserve at the back of this development into the, 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 the office space. And this forest that uh, we propose, it be become the, the concept in providing the space for the officer to hang around and become the place for the community that they can use the, the, the spot ground in, 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 in this um, office building. And it's all built up in the uh, uh, parking lot structure. So under, underneath is, a, is a, the, the parking lot. So you need to calculate the, 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 the earth, uh, uh, the soil depth, and how we're going to recycle the, the water to, to, re, to reuse for the planting the, the plant species. 
So I think this is one of the, 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 the examples showing that it can be possible if we can look to, into the, the alternative way in developing the, the city, in combining the, the greenery with the, the, the architecture and also uh, providing alternative way in using the, the space and become like a working and uh, meeting space outdoor, in outdoor environment in a hot climate. Because, a lot, because with a lot of trees, you, you can uh, sit under the shade very well. Another project that we'd like to show is about utilizing the, the expressway, uh, space underneath the expressway. Um, and then it's also our own initiative. We, we think that there's quite a lot and in, in the city to, to, to have this uh, expressway. And then we carry out uh, the own office run to try whether that can be possible to connect different parts of the city and become the park connector. And we think that this is one of the stretch that is possible. We are somewhere here, and this is the Japia River, and it will uh, connecting the transportation hub in the inner city to the Japia River, and it will connect to different um, district and area, and it can change the program accordingly. And uh, the thing is, the, the, the benefit of this is not about uh, providing the alternative way of uh, connectivity, but it's also connect to different uh, uh, park and uh, public spaces along the way as well. So it will encourage people to uh, come out and use this uh, park connector as part of everyday uh, life. And part of that um, idea, we quite um, lucky that we are able to implement it of uh, one kilometer stretch. So this is the, the space underneath the expressways. It's surrounded by uh, communities. And we gone through this uh, consultation with the communities in order to realize that. And, and the, the community is not only be part of uh, the, the thinking process, they also be part of the implementation process as well in uh, creating the art wall, uh, doing the uh, community, community gardens. And it has already been uh, finished, I think, uh, two years ago, and it just opened uh, last year. And it became the, the spot ground for the, the communities and food, and also the, the, the library space, the function space for the, for the people. And we just carry out uh, the Children Day's activities um, uh, a few weeks ago, and, and people love it. And I think what it changed is not about uh, the, 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 the physical space, it's about the uh, people interaction. So nowadays people get putting more interaction through this space by organizing many activities, and they're also forming the, the committee to taking care of the park with the government. So it's about collaboration work, and the, the park was being donated the, the money by the private sector. So I think this is one of the, the, the models that we would like to see more in creating another stretch of the 10 kilometer projects that uh, we are in the process of uh, convincing the developers and also the government agency to continue this uh, project to, to, to other stretch of the city. And as, you as I mentioned to you, is about the river um, that we are facing the the problems that we are uh, facing right now, because the government proposing to to have this promenade inside the river, and is about uh, creating the public space. If you think about the public space, I think it's a, it's a good idea to have the public space along the river. I think this is uh, the agenda that uh, most of the people might buy it. But uh, if you're looking at uh, condition and the context. Uh, of uh, Japria River very closely, you will realize that it might not be the good solution at all because um, we have already removed the riparian area along the river and then we are already constructing this um, gigantic uh, concrete embankment to protect the city from, from flooding. And in the near future, we're going to have another promenade inside. So the river is keep narrower. And how are we going to deal with uh, the increasing amount of the flood in the future? And what about uh, the way of life of the people who live along the river, what, what, what are the, the interactions that are going to uh, change in the future? I think this is uh, the topic that we've been discussing for the past three years. And this is what happened. 
you see this gigantic wall to keep the city from flooding. But at the same time, it keeps the river community and residents from entering to the river as they used to be. This is the grandma. They have the beautiful house by the river. And what happened is that they did, she didn't open her window to see the river. What she see every day is this wall. It's quite sad because when we asked the grandma what happened, she said because the government need to constructing this flood wall to protect the city from flooding. What can she say? Any alternative for her? No. The government, need to, so the, the grandma need to give the government um, per permission to constructing this wall without any alternative. It's not like what Anne just showed us just now, that the government will provide other alternative and there will be through a lot of consultation, but no, there's no alternative way. It's also about this promenade. There's no alternative way. This is the only way in revitalizing the river. So we organized, we found Friends of the River Group. It's a social group that we're also working with to providing the alternative solution and collecting the people's opinion and submit it to the, the government, whether is there any alternative way in doing it. I also be part of that uh, activist uh, in the past three years. So the role of the landscape architect to, to me is been shifting now and then. I think the idea in revitalizing the river is not about creating the promenade, it's two different things. I think it's about creating the area around the river and looking at the, in the holistic approach of what are the uh, priority, what are the issues involved in dealing with the water and the city at the same time. I think what we would like to see is how the area around the river will be developed by looking into the asset, the constraint, and the, the potential of each district. And this is one of the, the, the potential um, community that we've been working with in identifying the cultural heritage that the, the, the district has and come up with the idea of how we're going to be revitalizing it with the community through the arts uh, wall and a lot of uh, activities with the uh, students. And I think we can utilize and pro provide the alternative uh, in developing the stretch of the river in, in many, um, uh, uh, many options. One of the options that we've been working with for the past three years is um, it, it is a Jurong Grung area. As you know that the Jurong Grung is turning into the um, creative district right now. And the Thailand and Design Center is, has already been relocated to, to, to this area. And then it's not about the uh, location, it's about how we can turn the whole district to become more lively with the people. And it cannot be done through the eye of the, spe the specialist. It needs to go through this uh, consultation and co-creation process that uh, we designed this process for nine months in gone through a lot of uh, consultation. And then we end up with uh, the, the mock-up uh, test in order to encouraging the people to experience what will happen in the future. And those are the stakeholders from the government bodies to student, abbot, and the landlord. So they are in the same table. And they are the ones who identify the strategies and potential and the problems that we uh, would like to, to, to see in this district. And we come up with these um, three strategies. In rebranding re is about providing the landmark to, to make aware of this um, uh, uh, district. And revival, the abandoned um, chop house and also the, the, the empty uh, uh, land in, in, in the area to, to be more uh, lively with a lot of um, uh, activities and also Lee Link. So we would like to making sure that the district can be navigated through and allow the people to discover many undiscovered places inside. This is one of the proposal area that uh, we would like to see this uh, um, heritage building. Um, this is a quite an, uh, it's, it is a national building in a, in a way because it's a custom house. So in the past, when you come to Thailand, you need to stop in this um, custom house before you can enter into the, into the, the country. But uh, nowadays it's been empty and it's owned by the government. And what we would like to see is that it can turn into, uh, become the museum or the gallery and, and turn the uh, area in front to become the waterfront, like what the government would like to see. 
which is the good news, right? The bad news is the government decided to turn this into the five-star hotel. So how much, how do we need another five-star hotel along the Japaya River? I think probably not. I think we need more public uh, realm. We need more public uh, function. And I think we need to um, convey this message and convince uh, the government to, to change their mind. And this is what happened during the test day. So we're constructing this um, temporary uh, park and garden and turning the abandoned shop house into the workshop space and organizing the activity along the river. So, let the, so we, we, we're asking the people to try on and test what ha will happen in the future. Because normally, if you've done the, the master plan, you will wait for another five or 10 years to be implemented. And you never know what will happen. But here you can test it and experience it right away. And then we also collecting the, the feedback of, of, of it can be improved in the master plan. So during the design week last year, we also would like to um, proposing uh, creating this another conversation to the, to the society. Because we've been debating of uh, the possibility whether should we build a promenade inside the river or should to, or should, shouldn't, or where could we, and where we can find the place for the recreation and for the public uh, space. I think turning this uh, barge into the park, it might be another alternative in uh, providing the public space for the Bangkok Kian, because it don't uh, interfere with the river flow, and it can provide another special experience to the, to the people at the same time. So we combine those uh, barge that uh, normally can uh, carry the rice and construction material in the Jopo River and combining with the green and a lot of activities. And we believe that it will uh, catalyze, become the catalyst elements to, to, uh, and bring the people to different uh, communities along the river at the same time. So in the, in the barge itself, it's providing with a lot of uh, activities like uh, exhibition spaces uh, playground and space to see the movie during the night. And we're asking people, what would you like to see in the future? So there are many, a lot of possibilities that, got, that, that the people and the communities come up with. And we are lucky that we got a grant from the government to uh, implementing this um, right now. And this is a new version. So it just uh, finished it last night. It's part of the design week this year. And we got uh, the incorporating with the uh, Netherlands Embassy and also with the uh, SCG. So because SCG, which is the, the construction of a company, they uh, already has this uh, technology of the pontoon to supporting this solar panel. And we think that it is possible to combine this uh, aquatic plants and to uh, which helping to cleansing part of the uh, water quality to be cleaner in and if we can implement it um, along the riverbank in in its context it can be possible to providing this um, green energy to the communities and also at the same time helping the uh, water to be cleaner and can combining with some of the facility inside this pontoon so this is part of the prototype that we would like to develop in in this um, of year at the end of the, this year we might see some of the, the the new version of this and probably you can have a look um, after the, the forum actually the future is not that far it's go back to this uh, the past this is what I saw and during my uh, field trip and I saw this, this is what exactly I'm just telling you about the future you have this uh, residence they creating this uh, floating plantation and someday can catch the fish and, and can uh, sell their products to the, to the community nearby. So the future is, is not uh, that far. So sometimes we need to look at the, at the past and see what will happen. And of course, the, the world is full of problems and also full with the potential if you look at it very closely. And it's, I think it's about time to reposition ourselves, whether what is our role in that changing future and uh, with, that, uh, with a lot of challenges that we are facing. And I think some of the people using other things to change the territory, to change the city. 
But our ability and the tools and our weapon that we have is a pencil and a pen, right? So I think we need to use it wisely, and sometimes we need to give that weapon to other people to use it as well. So to let other people share your weapon and share your knowledge, empowering people and create uh, the better future. So thank you.